Welcome to everybody. I'm Debbie Frontiero. I work with Essex County Community Organization. We frequently do um, uh, candidate forums for um, different candidates in the state. We work at the local level. We, most of our work tends to be at the state level. Um, but what happens at Beacon Hill matters. It matters a lot to us. So we're doing the candidates forum tonight and I finally got Miss Sullivan in here so I can Yay. enter her. Except it's not doing it. <laughs> okay. I don't know. I'm trying to get Miss Sullivan on the Zoom so that folks at home can see her as well. And it's not admitting participants there we are now she's in it's coming up people are just coming in like crazy so that's why I'm I apologize for taking time but we're going to spend each candidate's going to spend about five minutes introducing themselves tell us what their campaign's all about and then we're going to be opening it to questions so Ms. Sullivan, are you in the Zoom yet? Uh, yes, ma'am, I All am. All right, wonderful. Now, um, Ms. Sullivan is uh, a candidate for state representative. She will be hopefully on the Republican, on the ballot in November for the Republican side. No, <laughs> she is not going to be on your primary ballots. Uh, no, I'm actually a write-in candidate. So um, we actually we had an unfortunate uh, issue with a few of our sheets, um, and they kicked them back. Uh, so while we collected over 250 wet signatures, by the time it was said and done, we were down to 145. Oh. Um, so unfortunately, because of that, uh, we're now running the writing campaign. In the writing campaign, I'm actually coming to find I'm really enjoying it because I am getting out there and talking with voters more than I had prior. You know, just gathering the signatures, it's great. You get some time in, but you know, more and more and more. So it's it's good. I'm getting feedback and then it's something that has been very enjoyable for me. Um, I am actually a mother of two of my own. I have two stepdaughters. I am my husband who, um, him and I, we have a small business doing marine electronics and navigation. Um, we started out, <laughs> I, I've had a rough life. Um, I started out at the, you know, on my own on the streets at a very young age. I, uh, you know, worked my way through that. People were getting ready for graduation and prom. I was bouncing couch to couch trying to survive. I made it through that. Um, we actually came here on vacation and I fell in love with the area and I never went back. I've been here almost 20 years now. Um, I love it here. This is my home. This is the longest I've been anywhere. Um, and I, you know, I see the changes around town just like everyone else and I um, it was enough for me as a mother, a business owner, and, you know, just as a human being to say, okay, there are a lot of people going misrepresented here. Um, there are a lot of things going on that, you know, shouldn't, policy-wise, it, it, it t tends to favor um, one group more than others, I should say. And so it, I decided to run to try and bring some balance to the state house and to you know bring a, a common sense voice to the all the noise um, people tend to everybody tends to think about the worst about the other side these days and I think that that's really sad I think it's really important that we all realize we want the best for you know each other ourselves our families our neighbors our friends I think we all just have different ways of wanting to go about that and so if we agree on more than we realize. And I think that um, if we would compromise and come together, we could really make a difference um, and make life better for constituents on Cape Ann. Um, we have one of the highest inflation rates right now in the, in the country. Our state is like in the top five, I believe, for inflation. Um, that is because of the taxes, fees, fines, regulations, 
that's all built up, built up, built up, built up. And now here we are um, where people are struggling to feed their families. They're struggling to keep a roof over their head. Um, housing, yes, it is a big issue. Um, but, the, you know, you can only build so much affordable housing. That's a Band-Aid. It's not fixing the problem. The problem's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and I, part of, I believe, that issue is the affordable guidelines and the areas we're a part of. Um, like, for instance, our area, we have Boston. Uh, so that drives our rates up. That drives everything up for us. So it, it's kind of, um, it's one of those things where I just, there needs to be like a hold up, wait a minute on both sides. And um, I hope to be that. I am here, my family drives me. That's what motivates me. Um, my experiences, I, you know, I was on my own at a young age. During the Obama years, we were living in Rockport on Jewett. My husband got laid off. We uh, lost everything. Um, I ended up on the streets again with two kids this time. I, after 10 years of paying thousands and thousands a month into the system, when we needed help, it was not there. There was nothing there for us. Um, it was bouncing job to job, picking up, you know, things here and there. We pulled ourselves out of it. Um, and I found that the government was always holding me back in these instances. Like when they took my license, when I couldn't pay my excise taxes on my car that had been repossessed. And I was without my license for four years, working part time on the side, on the side, just to get my license back, to be able to afford that. Um, and so I think that some of these taxes and these policies and, you know, oh, it's to help people, it's to help people, but you're harming a lot of people in the process too. So there's got to be some balance there. Um, we're, we're, we're shrinking the middle class. And it's our own fault because of the policies we pass. Locally, our economy, the fishermen, they have gotten the shaft. Where are our elected leaders on this? I know there's more that can be done by the state. I absolutely know there is. Um, as you just saw, the Supreme Court ruling, I know there's international waters, state waters. And, um, there's a lot to that there. But I also know that there are things that the state can do that make it difficult on the feds. If they want to make it hard on the fishermen, these windmills coming in, that's another thing. What, why are we doing this? Did you, look what just happened. Why aren't our elected leaders speaking out against this? In fact, um, Ann Margaret just raised, you know, passed a bill that raises the price cap off offshore wind, which causes your electricity rates to go up. Um, um, yeah, we're, yeah, so <laughs> we're, it's, we're it's policies like that that have, that have um, you know, motivated me to run, and that's why I'm here today. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. And I'm sure based on what you've said, there'll be a lot of folks with yeah. questions for you. Um, our other candidate who will be on the ballot in the Democratic primary is Nathaniel Mulcahy. And Nathaniel, would you like five minutes to introduce yourself and your please. campaign, please? So good evening, everybody. Thank you, Echo. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Sawyer Free Library. And thank you for everybody here in person and on Zoom and on the recording. And Ashley, thank you for coming. Oh, thank you. Um, it is unusual, and I think it speaks well of Massachusetts, that we are having a forum with Democratic and Republican candidates in the primary, before the primary. I think that speaks really well of, of our community. Um, we have a community where we have a Democratic representative. We have a Republican uh, senator. Um, and we have been able to function as a community despite party lines, and I think that's commendable. So this is a wonderful experience, and I'm glad that we're all here tonight. Me as well. Um, the fact that Ms. Sullivan and I are both here tonight uh, bespeaks the fact that I think we are ready for change. There are a lot of issues that need to be addressed. Um, over the past 13 years, there have been issues in terms of um, the climate crisis, women's rights, housing, education, the fishing industry, the support of our first responders, open public green spaces, and many, many other issues. That these were huge issues 13 years ago. And if we did a show of hands, how many people think things are better in any of those categories now? Hands up? N not one. 
And I think that, that says why we're both running here. We're ready to try and do something different. So I am Nathaniel Mulcahy. Um, I am running for state representative. It would be an honor to be your state representative, but even just running is an honor because it, call, it gives us an opportunity to discuss the things that need to be done, the things that haven't been done. In terms of my background, I, one of the things I'm most proud of is that I was an elementary school teacher for 12 years. So I come to this race as the only candidate who has a real understanding about the education system. I taught K through six for 12 years. I was a, um, a vice principal in Upper Michigan. Um, these are issues that are fundamental to our community. We cannot move forward as an economy, as a community, as a country without big investments in education. Um, the countries that you work in, the countries I've worked in that have invested more in education have a higher GDP growth rate. It's just that simple. Um, after 12 years of teaching, I went back to school for the first of several degrees in engineering and science. Um, I went on to a great career that I very, really enjoyed becoming the director of research and development at a large multinational and then going off and founding my own humanitarian engineering company back in 1999. In 2010, my company called World Stove became the first company in the world that was certified as carbon negative and I've been dealing with climate issues ever since. Within this state, I see the climate issues and within this community, the climate issues, housing, and education as being the most critical issues that we have to address immediately. But we can't address any of those issues until we deal with the elephant in the room, and not, not a Republican comment, because, yeah, I, because, <laughs> because in, in, reality, in, <laughs> in reality, there is an elephant in the room, and that is transparency. Massachusetts is the only state in the country where we don't know how our representatives vote. Our representatives have even legally exempted themselves from public records requests. This means no transparency, no accountability, no progress. If you think about what that means to Massachusetts, there are bills that have been sitting languishing in the State House for decades, not years or months, decades. For example, Medicare for All, it's been on the ballot for 35 years. It's been on the docket for 35 years without getting passed. Other issues have been there, like LGBTQ rights have been there for eight years, voting rights for 13 years, keeping families together for 17 years. Healthcare issues have been on the ballot and on the dockets for 30 years. Nothing is getting done, and we can't have anything done because we have no way of holding our representatives accountable. So first and foremost, we must address the issues of transparency. Without transparency, we cannot move this state forward, and we can't do the things that we need to do. Massachusetts has the highest number of ballots on the docket of any state in this country, and Massachusetts passes the fewest number of bills of any state in this country. Does that sound like democracy to you? So, again, my name is Nathaniel Mulcahy. I'm running for state rep. I am honored to be running as a Democrat, but I do have to tip my hat to the Republican Party as well, because the Republican Party, to their credit, in Massachusetts have been the ones who have been voting for and fighting for transparency for the past 10 years. So I think we can both agree, and everybody attending this meeting can agree, that more transparency means more democracy, and that's good for all of us. Thank you very much, Nathaniel. My pleasure. Um, I'd like to just speak with the folks at Zoom, on Zoom. If you could all mute yourselves on Zoom, and you can just raise your hand if you want to ask a question, and I will call on you. Um, but if you can mute yourselves, that would be, it will stop some of the feedback that's uh, there. So anyway, so we're going to, based on what you've heard from the candidates, uh, we're going to open it up for questions. Um, I know I'm concerned about a lot of things. I'm concerned about transparency. I'm concerned about education. I'm concerned about housing. Um, ECHA has worked at the state level on several pieces of legislation and, um, you know, uh, things that protect immigrant rights we've worked on. And um, so I have a lot of concerns, and I'm assuming that you folks sitting out there have a lot of concerns as well. So you can raise your hand and we'll point on you. I'm getting 
Oh, I'm sorry, that's right. Um, if you have, if you would like to ask a question of the candidates, both candidates will have a couple of minutes to reply, but please do it at the microphone here so that everybody at home can hear us. So uh, any questions that folks want to ask about? Uh, yep, right here in the, yep, yeah, right over here. And if you speak in the microphone, then everyone will be able to hear you. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Mary Pat. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I do have a transparency concern, but it's around misappropriation of funds at the state and at the city level. We have to know what's being done at Beacon Hill and City Hall. And as an example, let's look at what's happening with the MBTA. Absolute disgrace. We can't keep the damn thing on the rails. They're spontaneously combusting. We've been throwing so much money down that toilet for the last 40 years. You know, we need accountability in the State House. So if you're running, I want to know what you're going to do, and then please to you. It's a great question. Transparency, not only on a legislative basis, but on an economic basis. The fact that our small drawbridge, which left us without a train for over two and a half years, cost $100 million is the North Shore equivalent of the Big Dig. Why did it cost so much? As an engineer, I can't fathom why it costs so much. So you, it is a spectacular question. The legislators have even voted to not have transparency within campaign financing. So we can't have a transparent legislation or a transparent economy without addressing these issues. In terms of the rail issue, which I'm glad you brought up, one of the climate issues that we can address easily is by having more public transportation. But that doesn't mean just the first upfront investment of a new line. It means to do what we have neglected as a state and as a commonwealth for a long time, which is systematic maintenance of everything. We are a terrible state when it comes to basic maintenance, and that too will cover the cost of maintenance. That has to be explained, because as with the big dig, a lot of money vanishes. We need to know where every penny goes. The question is about misappropriation. I want to know where my money is. Great. Um, along those lines, there is a bill that is going to be on the ballot this fall, in November, you have the right to vote on the fair share amendment. The fair share amendment takes money from people who earn over a million dollars. You take that, say you earn a million dollars and one dollar. No, I want to know what Beacon Hill has done with 40 years worth of taxpayer money. Where is it? That, un Where is it? that unfortunately, we... And what will you do when I, you get there? These are great to questions. We can't find those issues easily, at least at the representative level, because a lot of those votes are done behind closed doors. We cannot do that. Well, I am running specifically. So I am running specifically my first issue on my platform. And you can go to my webpage, which is votemolke.com. You will see my number one issue is transparency. So we can do transparency in two ways. One. We can get bills passed, which get all of the House re uh, representatives to agree to transparency, which would, in an ideal democratic system, be the best, because that's what people want. And representatives, by the name of their job title, are obliged to represent. So we want the transparency. They're supposed to represent what we want. So in a dream world, I would, I would write that bill. Will they vote for it? Absolutely not. If you look at the votes for transparency, there have been one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine votes on transparency in the past three legislative sessions. And they voted against it by a large majority. So as a state representative, I have a second silver bullet in my arsenal, which is I have the ability to then speak publicly. The press is our partners within democracy. I can go to the press after every single vote and say, these are how our representatives voted, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and go down the list. If they won't vote with us in public, I can make that public as an individual. And that is my right, and that is part of the freedom of the press. Well, I'd appreciate 
Thank you. Um, so as far as my answer, I absolutely agree with you about the money. Um, in fact, we did a FOIA request to get the records because we wanted to get a detailed budget breakdown for the school. And in particular, during the COVID era, they were same, but the budget was the same. Budget didn't change, but they weren't in classes. There were materials that weren't being used. There should have been a diff some sort of difference there. In fact, the budget the following year went up. So we did a FOIA request. Now, FOIA requests, you're supposed to get your answer, right? They tried to charge us $985 for this FOIA request. So we were unable to get the data. Now, legally, they can't overcharge you, but they can't charge you for their time spent. So there's a, there's a loophole there. I think that there needs to be a bill passed. People need to, there needs all of this, the money, there needs to be better budget breakdowns across the board, um, even for the city. You go and you look, you get a, a partial breakdown, and there's no full breakdown, and we've tried to find one. Um, that's not, I, I don't agree with that, and I'm on the same page with you as that. I absolutely believe that they should be providing, or you should have the ability, everything's by computer now, it's really simple. Um, people should have the ability to log on and look at the breakdown, the, a full breakdown of the budget, not a partial breakdown. Um, there are areas on the budget that should absolutely be broken down farther based off their own current model that they don't break down. And I think that that's a lot, what you're talking about, the misappropriation, I think that that's how a lot of that ends up happening. Um, so I think that if we pass something and we took a look, look at the current laws and what our ability is to pass something going forward where there is more transparency, where they have to provide a better breakdown of taxpayer dollars because they absolutely, they should be doing it to begin with, um, I would absolutely back something like that. Um, and I would even proactively, you know, research what legally can be done there uh, myself um, because it is, it's very important and I think it's a big part of our current issue. Thank you. Um, we do want to get on to other questions. I have one question um, on Zoom from Deanna Fay. Deanna, uh, can you unmute yourself and ask your question and I will repeat it for everyone to hear. Not asking the question right now, I'm just pleading with everybody who is on Zoom to put yourself on mute because it's so, so challenging oh, okay. to hear from our end. Um, specifically, so, David Kaplan, who's logged on twice and is muted on one account but not the other, and there's a crying baby in the background. Okay, which is, this is a really, <coughs> really, really challenging to hear. This is a technological request for folks on Zoom. Please, please, please mute yourselves. Make sure you're muted. Thank you. Uh, do we have another question from the audience? Yep. Um, hi, thank you for the opportunity. Um, I want to ask two interrelated questions. So one of the things that is a huge problem uh, in most of the North Shore, certainly all of Cape Ann, is the affordability of housing. But that absolutely also relates to what our minimum wages are at this point in time. So my question is not what do you think about affordable housing, but what will you do to increase the range of affordable housing and at the same time improve minimum wage so people can actually afford the housing that is available. And I'm talking about housing and affordability all the way from those people who are low income up through the middle class, since nearly 50% of the residents of Gloucester are eligible for affordable housing within the HUD guidelines. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Nathaniel, would you? Thank you for that, que that double question. So um, I certainly hope Representative Ferrante has a speedy recovery. Um, I hope that she is feeling well. 
because I would love her to be present to answer those questions as well and have a fair shot at having her voice heard too because these are questions that all of us have the right to ask of our representatives. In terms of minimum wage, and I'm so glad you led with that aspect, within Massachusetts, for a single person working a single job full time, minimum wage to afford a one bedroom apartment on the average price, I'm not talking the, the you know, back bay down in Boston, I'm talking about the entire state where we're including even the lower rent aspects of the central part of our state. You would need to have minimum wage be $38 an hour to be able to afford an apartment. The fact that our representative refused to co-sponsor or vote for an increase of the minimum wage is a dereliction of duty and it says we are not supporting the people of our community who need to live here. Stores are closing, small businesses are closing, people are leaving here because they can no longer afford to live here. So at the very beginning, we have to raise the minimum wage. The last time minimum wage was raised was 13 years ago. That's how long our representative has been in office. It needs to go up. Everything else has gone up. If milk has gone up, certainly minimum wage has the right to go up too. In terms of housing, we have a double problem, specifically in, within our communities of Manchester-by-the-Sea, Rockport, Gloucester, and Essex, which is we are seaside communities. That makes us incredibly desirable. And during the pandemic, we became even more desirable because Boston found out being in lockdown in a small studio apartment off of Copley isn't as great as you thought it would be. So for the cost of a single studio in Boston, you could come up here and buy a really nice house, but that drove our market prices up at about 28% a year, which is unsustainable. It means people like good friends of mine who until just two days ago were about to move to Western Massachusetts because despite the fact that they were born here, they were born here and their children and grandchildren born here, they were no longer able to live here because their landlord was raising the rent. One of the reasons that's happening is because there's a drive of ink market. And okay, we live in a capitalistic society, free market economy. I have no control over that. But as a representative, I would have control over things that are driving our costs up. For example, the Airbnb market, where on the street where I live in, where I moved there, they were all family houses. Now more than half of them are owned by corporations who use them as Airbnb and just for profit. That's driving our cost of real estate up because there are investors buying houses here who don't even live in our community, not even in our commonwealth. So. Beverly gives a great example. If you want Airbnb, fabulous, but they have to be owner occupied. And that would start dealing with that issue, which is driving our prices at this 28% unsustainably per year. Does that answer? Thank you for the questions. Yeah, and Ashley? Um, so for me, <laughs> I think raising minimum wage, it's another one of those, we're putting the Band-Aid on the, the problem. It'll help in the meantime, but in the long run, it's just gonna keep going up and up and up. The real root of the problem is what is driving those co housing costs up um, for us to need to raise the minimum wage. Do you see what I'm saying? I'm not saying that it's not something that should be discussed, but I am saying it, it's, it's a, it's a temp Band-Aid. It's just gonna keep going. So a lot of the problem, and I've, I've spoken to homeowners in the area, and my, my mother-in-law, she owns property here. She tried to get Section 8 approved to be able to provide affordable housing. They came in, they did the inspection. This blind is cracked on the corner that's hanging in your window. This, you know, has dust in the thing, and you've got a this and this. Um, this isn't updated, you know, it's a plastic piece. It's not, it, it doesn't, it's a knob, but it doesn't, because it's not up to date by a certain standard or year, they, you know. So the government, there are certain things that the government have, has done that's made it really hard. And I tell you, these are really nice homes, but they're getting shot down because they have a crack in their blinds. I. That's crazy. People can't live there because of a crack in a blind. Why is the government 
And so that's why people, more landlords, don't offer Section 8 housing. I think that there needs to be some balance there as far, you know, they're trying to control that too much. I think that absolutely everybody should have, you know, nice, decent housing. I'm not saying slum lords. That's a totally different example. We're talking nice rentals that something tiny is wrong and it gets shot down. Um, and so I know it's meant to prevent some lords, but what you're also doing is you're preventing good landlords. You're, you're creating all of this hassle for good landlords, and they don't want to put up with it. So they say, forget it. We just won't get Section 8 certified. Um, that's a problem. When the government is that entrenched that people don't want to rent out their property because, you know, that's, that's a problem. Um, and that's a guaranteed income every month. You got to think they're turning down a guaranteed Section 8. The check comes from the government every month. And they're still turning it down because of the hassle that it entails. That's a problem. Um, well, I, uh, I think, I, I'm not sure, but I just want to make sure we're answering the question. I don't think we were talking about low income or Section 8. She housing. was talking about. We raising, were talking about, you know, if you're a right. teacher or a social worker. Yeah, or, she was talking you know, about having a to. A librarian. What would you do to, to increase that the of housing. by affordable the for everybody is that what I am I hearing your question I want to make sure I'm hearing your question right so that's that in particular is how you increase more affordable housing you've got more landlords yeah more people wanting to rent out um, another example uh, the tax rates I know homeowners the tax rates on their homes She's, I, I spoke to a woman and she said it's gone up, t it's gone up almost 15% in 10 years. Insane amounts. Um, that's, that's crazy. So now they have a bigger nut to crack. Something breaks, they, you know, the, the roof, they need to replace the roof. They've got a bigger nut to crack. These are all things for, that you have to plan for as a, as a homeowner and as a landlord. And so when you're trying to rent out to people, that's what you assess when you figure out the rent. And the government has controlled things to a point and made things so expensive that, you know, these landlords are raising the rent and it just keeps going and going and going. And hence needing to raise the minimum wage now. Um, so it's, people can't afford it. More government involvement, the more it goes up. And that's the reality of the situation. Um, and so I think we need to find a balance. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I see Nathaniel's wanting to respond to that. We're a forum, we're not a debate, but I do want each candidate to be able to respond to what the other has said. Um, did you want to respond to that? Just Nathaniel? a very quick follow-up. Ashley makes a very good point about taxation, but I'd like to elaborate on that. Being that we are a predominantly coastal community and that many people own their second or third or fourth homes here. One way to address the housing in the taxation aspect is we can lower the residential housing. If you were a permanent resident and this is your primary residence, we could have a lower tax rate for that. And if this is your second, third, fourth, fifth house, then we can increase the tax rate based on the number of houses that you own. That way the net tax revenue to our communities does not change, but people who are part of our communities are not harmed by the rising inflation. That's, uh, that's actually um, something that I think that people would consider bipartisan um, once you start getting up there in property ownership, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Another thing that I would like to say too is um, I, I think that there should be property tax vouchers for the elderly. Um, allow the elderly to stay in their homes. They're on a fixed income. They can't, they're, they're struggling with taxes going up the way they are, let them stay in their homes. Um, they should be able to apply for that voucher at a certain age. Um, mm -hmm. Did we have any other questions from the audience around the housing issues? Or, And if you have a question, please go to the microphone so that we can hear it. I just wanted to address. Yep, right there. Hi, my name's Mary Ann Anderson. I just wanted to address the fact that uh, what you were talking about and taxes going up, well, the taxes are going up, and for retired people, it is a problem. The increase in the housing uh, affordability, what's happening is 
the houses that the um, the amount the houses of worth are going up, which is increasing your taxes, and that's not a fit. You don't want to sell your house. You don't want to buy a house, but your taxes are going up nevertheless because of the rate that the the other houses, the you know, they're assessing your house at a much higher rate. So now everybody, whether you're working or whether you're retired, has to come up with more money to pay the taxes because the rate of the house isn't going up. Mm -hmm. That was a, a good point. And, and given that our community has a lot of senior citizens, as Ashley has mentioned, and as your question alludes to, the issue is there are people in my neighborhood who's, who have paid off their houses. They did the hard work. They paid off their mortgage. But their current tax, their monthly tax bill, exceeds what their mortgage payments were. So they can't stay here anymore. That, that is a really good issue that needs to be brought up at the state house level, and it could be addressed by the differential tax rate, which would be if you're a permanent resident, you get a lower tax rate. If this is your second, third, or fourth home, you get a higher tax rate. I had the great benefit of growing up biculturally in, in two different countries. So I grew up in Massachusetts and in Italy. In Italy, my mom's house, which is a nice house, her annual tax rate is about $160 for the whole house. If she owned a second house, the taxes on that house would be about $6,000. That's the way you deal with residents versus vacation homes. And I think we can do that in Massachusetts. We need to do that in, in Cape Ann specifically because there are so many vacation homes here. And Ms. Sullivan, did you um, I actually really, I do really agree with that policy. I'm, I'm, I think that that's good. Um, very okay. clever. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you for thank you for that. Um, I. The, that's been one of my biggest concerns with some of the new buildings and units that they've been putting in, driving up the property value for surrounding neighbors. Um, you know, we desperately need the housing, but at the same time, you're negatively affecting the current homeowners. It's such a tough situation, and I think that there has to be some balance there you can't go too far one way and you can't go too far another it's almost like you know you've got to keep both sides in mind when you're doing this um, because without the homeowners then we don't have landlords and we don't have rentals and the problem just gets worse and worse so there needs to be we need to take if we could figure out where our tax dollars are going we might be able to make some cuts and then the concept we could lower the taxes you know so I, I it all comes back to transparency doesn't it yeah. it really does <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I I think that he's on I think that it's like I said it's about balance keeping both sides in mind they're not going too far one way or another we can't let a million developers come in and throw stuff up everywhere because that would just you know but at the same time We've got to figure out housing for people or how to get those rates lower. And I think a combination of things like what he has mentioned, um, lower taxes, the property tax vouchers, those sorts of things, I think that that would really all together help ease that situation a little bit. Well, thank you both for talking some about housing. We could talk about housing all day, all day <laughs> because it is a very complicated issue. And I think it's an issue that's central to the welfare of our community because if you can't afford to live in this community then you're probably not going to be able to work in this community and this community is built on the vast majority of our businesses are small locally owned businesses and uh, you know that's something that we have to keep in mind so the housing problem that we're having here is I believe one of our most essential. So I want to thank you for asking questions about it and for addressing it. I think this is just the tip of the iceberg on yep. that subject. Does anyone have a follow-up question on this or we can move on to, to other questions? People? Um, do I have, oh, more people coming in admitting. Do, anyone on Zoom just press the raise your hand if you have a question that you'd like to ask. If not, I'll kind of move on. Um, 
one of the things that issues that we have here in the state is how do we deal justly, fairly for our citizens and our new immigrants? And mm. Gloucester is an immigrant community. We're the world's oldest seaport. We've seen wave after wave of immigrant folks coming in. And especially now, at a time when um, it's hard to fill jobs. Rest we have some restaurants in town that have cut their hours. One restaurant in Essex is not even open weekends because they can't find a weekend cook. So we, you know, this is a population we know we need to embrace, but we want to do it in a way that's fair. So there's been a couple of pieces of legislation up at the State House dealing with this. Um, one, um, it's been in the news a whole lot lately. It's called the Worker and Family Mobility Act. Um, and what it would do is allow uh, folks who are not documented to be able to have driver's licenses. They wouldn't be a regular driver's license. You couldn't use it to get on a plane or anything like that. But it would require that these folks would be uh, trained, um, pass a test, and have to get insurance because I think, you know, as we know now, there's so many times when there's a, an accident and somebody flees the scene because, you know, well, whatever reason they're doing it. But uh, the police chiefs have been very much on board with this. Um, and I was really in, I know that there's um, a ballot initiative going on right now to try and have this go back on the ballot, even though it was passed in, at the state level. So it's really kind of a touch button issue right now, and I was wondering if each candidate would address their feelings about allowing undocumented folks to to legally drive in the state. Yeah, I will absolutely start. So um, a lot. I am not in agreement with this bill. Um, I for several reasons. First and foremost. Um, if you or I or anyone else were to break the law or not pay our taxes, as I have been through myself, we, they take our license. You're not allowed, they take your license away until you settle that issue or pay your taxes. Um, they got me that way. Um, when I was at my worst, they got me that way. I didn't even have the car anymore. Um, I still paid it. I still put in the work. I still got my license back. I did what I was supposed to. Um, it, it was a tough lesson, but it was one that I needed to learn regardless, and I took care of my responsibilities. I think that we are focusing on all of the wrong things. We are focusing on picking and choosing which laws we can and cannot break, instead of making it easier for people to follow those laws. Why? are we having the same argument here when I know both sides are in agreement in support of making it easier for people to come here legally? I fully support legal immigration. I have immigrants in both sides of my family, mine, the in-laws. Um, you know, I've got friends that are immigrants. I have no problem with immigration. I think it's, immigration's great. Um, the more the merrier, I'm, I'm, you're more than welcome. But please come legally. And the reason I ask that is not because I think all immigrants are bad people or because I think that, you know, they're bad people or they're do doing something wrong, but it's instead because that there are bad people in the world. And those bad people take advantage of those loopholes and those things. And it causes a lot of problems. The states th that they've passed this bill, they've passed this bill in seven different states. California started January 1st, 2015. In the first five years, they saw a 25% increase in traffic fatalities. That's 750 additional deaths per year. The population, the driving population, only grew by 3%. The deaths way outpaced the driving population. So we know that that's not the increase in population. In the first two years, Hit and runs increased by 26% because they may have their license, but if they're still illegal, they think that when the police come, they're going to get taken away. And so they run. And so then what happens is everybody's insurance rates shot up through the roof. And so everybody started paying more on their insurance. So I think that we need to focus more on 
making it easier to follow and respecting the laws that we have, making it easier for them to come to America, making it easier, and these are something we need to be, we've got to get elected leaders in there that want to make that happen. They've campaigned on this for years. I know there are Republicans that are okay with this. They haven't fixed it. Why is that? Part of me wants to think, you know, they're, it's because they want to use it to run on every election cycle. And part of me wants to think, okay, you know, maybe there's something more going on there that, you know, we don't know behind the scenes. And there's a reason why. Um, I'm not naive enough to think, though, that there aren't alternative, you know, not everyone is as kind as <laughs> is Mr. McCulley here or and vice versa on the Republican side. So you just don't know. Um, but with what I have seen, it's not okay. Uh, this year, because of these picking and choosing of laws and open border policies, 20,000 women and children have been trafficked in March alone, and that's each year, that's, that's regular. This year, in March alone, 54,000 family units, 19,000 unaccompanied minors trafficked over the border. That's according to the State Department. People are getting hurt because we're ignoring and picking and choosing which laws to follow. We need to respect our laws across the board. We need to keep our taxpayers safe. We need to keep their insurance premiums down so they can afford to drive their car. And we need to absolutely make it easier for these people to immigrate here so that they can get their license and we don't have to go through this. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mulcahy. Um, with regard to the bill that you bring up, yes, I have campaigned for it for four years. So I am 100% mm -hmm. in favor of it and I have been lobbying for it for four years with pride. We are a family of immigrants. We are living on borrowed land. We are all immigrants. Um, and we are here with communities that have been here since before 1620. And they are still here. So it's important to acknowledge that. With regard to immigration, yes, legal immigration is a wonderful thing. As I mentioned, my family are immigrants. Everybody here, uh, with the exception of one that I see, um, are immigrants as well. The critical issue is the immigration process is very lengthy. Our health care system, our farm workers, our transportation, our sanitation workers, sadly, do not often meet those immigration things. But our society, our economy would collapse without their frontline service, which we have seen throughout the pandemic has been saving people's lives to allow people the dignity of having a driver's license does not only allow them to contribute economically to our society, but it reduces the risks to the rest of us because the, the insurance premiums that uh, Ashley very wisely pointed out would actually be reduced if people had legal licenses and legal insurances because when you're in an accident with somebody who is uninsured, you're responsible for the whole bill, even if you are not responsible for the accident. Having people licensed means there are safer drivers on the road and the insurance premiums will go down because it's not our bills that are being paid, it's the person who has the accident, whether they're the immigrant or not, it's the person who has the right to drive. Thank you. Thank you. Any follow-up questions or comments on that issue? It's a huge issue right now. It's going to be coming up a lot in the following weeks. I, I do. I, I want to remark on a, a statement. Yes, uh, if you could, you, do you mind going to this? Yeah, I do. You know. <laughs> <But yeah. laughs> I know. Nobody likes to. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up on Ashley's comment that she made when California issued the licenses to the illegals and their insurances did go up. Yes, they, their insurance rates went up. Uh, they, like I said, saw a 25% increase in traffic fatalities. That's 750 additional deaths per year. In the first two years, hit and runs increased no. by 26%. Um, I'm not sure where those came Pew. from. Pew. Pew Research. I, I, I would like to respond to that.
comment, if I may? Yes, certainly. There's a difference between causation and correlation. And just because the accidents increased, because the fatalities increased, there is nothing that has concretely linked the increase of illegal immigrant licensing to those fatalities. None of those studies, not even the one from Pew, said that there was a direct correlation between the two. So it's very important that we stick to the facts. Yes, there was an increase of accidents. Was it related to the unlicensed or the licensed community that had just received licenses? We do not have that data, so we, it is very dangerous to make those assumptions. At the same time, I, I don't actually, that's not what I had read. I actually got the information from a Boston paper initially and then went on Pew and looked. But I will say that um, if we can't assume based off of the numbers that they do have, then we can't assume that it's safe either. And, that's, and there shouldn't be assumptions there either way. And I, I think that that's something that we should look further into before we push it through. Yes, a question? If you a comment. Yep. I'm a little um, concerned about the topic of giving illegals licenses because, guys, it wasn't that long ago, 9 11, we had a plane fly right out of Boston. And we had illegals who boarded because they had licenses. So I think we really need to have a balanced approach. I, I agree with balance. Just, um, just <laughs> any other comments on this subject? Because uh, I just want to make a this is such a complex discussion around immigration. Mm -hmm. And it, as Ashley stated, it's one which our legislators on the state and on the national level have failed us for many, many years. Um, they have not found ways to bring people into this country legally, to allow them the protections while they're here. Because as long as they are here illegally, they do not have the same rights and status as all of us, I would assume, in this room who are here as legal citizens. They can be uh, abused criminally. They are vulnerable people. We should be finding ways as a society to bring people in legally because otherwise we not only have a situation of many people being incredibly harmed by the trafficking that goes on, to get here, and we don't even, the horrible stories, we should say a prayer every night for all of these people Absolutely. who are tortured and tormented by this process that we're allowing to continue. My concern about legislation like this is we're, again, maybe it's a Band-Aid, I'm, I'm sensing it more as a, um, an attempt to recognize that we all have value as human beings, and I again hope everybody in this room feels that way, um, but it's, it's giving a little while so much more is actually needed. And I think um, encouragement of any forms of illegal immigration whether it's border policies or policies like this where people get benefits like being able to get a driver's license or other benefits that may not even be available to others of us. Um, we need to really rethink this kind of piecemeal process because people are suffering right now being left for dead on the border or just, just in Mexico they're being uh, tormented, and we can't, as a people, morally justify that anymore. So I, I, I understand the need to give people dignity, Mr. Mulcahy, who talked about that. Um, but the biggest issue is to deal with this in a holistic fashion. Um, okay. um, like any more, maybe that. one more comment on that, and then maybe we can move to another subject if that unless someone has some burning comments they need to make that would be 
So I would just remind us that the question that was asked was not about immigration. No. <laughs> immigration is a enormously complex issue. I absolutely grant you that. And it is an issue that has to get addressed at the federal level. There's not so much we can do about it at the local level. But the question before us is the Work and Family Mobility Act, which is, in my opinion, an act that improves the safety for every single person in our Commonwealth and in our city, because it requires that everybody who is driving be tested, licensed, and insured. It is a public safety issue. And I would like to bring the public safety question back to the candidates yes. and hear again why you either support it or don't. We are not talking about a measure that would encourage immigrants to come to this country legally or illegally. We are talking about making it possible for people who live here, lots of people in our own community, who, as you know, we all know, you have to drive to get to the doctor, to get to school, to get to church, to get to the hospital, to get to work, for God's sake. Because how much employment is there around? It goes absolutely back to my housing and minimum uh, uh, wage question. We have to make it possible for the driving conditions to be safe for all of us. And that's the question that we were asking our candidates. Yes. And I'd like to hear them respond to. Uh, thank you for kind of bringing us back. We could get off on, we talked about getting off on housing. We could get off on immigration. Yes, we are talking about it from a public safety standpoint. And just uh, with that, um, the vast majority of police chiefs supported. Our own police chief here in Gloucester was a very vocal supporter um, so to of respond, having everyone trained in order to. To respond to very quickly. I 100% agree. It is a matter of safety for everybody in our community. However, I do want to say thank you to the previous commenter because you brought in the issue of empathy, and I want to thank you for your empathy. That's it. Yes, thank you. All right, and I uh, stated that the numbers that came out of the states that have already passed this, um, the fatalities went up, hit and runs increased, and the driving population only increased by 3%. To me, that doesn't really look like it's making the community safer. So um, I disagree, and that's where I stand. Okay. Um, anything else? One more. <laughs> we will move on. <laughs> I just have a caveat to that. If we let them immigrants, illegal immigrants, come in undocumented, whatever you want, consider them, call them give them a license, but it's not necessarily going to ensure that they have insurance. So there is two parts to that as well that you have to think of and consider. You can't register a car without having insurance. People drive around They don't have their own car. If they're driving in someone else's car and they get a nice, an accident, who's to mm -hmm. be responsible then? Are, are these it questions all considered and thought of? I, I don't know yes. the spell that you're talking about. Yeah, there's a lot of information out there on the Worker and Family Mobility Act. A lot of data has been collected. So I definitely encourage people to look up the bill and do some reading. There's been years, years of research on this topic. So um, I think if it's okay, we can move on. I wanted to move on a little bit into um, the field of education, um, it is something that we in our public uh, schools here in Gloucester um, look at all the time in all of, all of Cape Ann. And um, specifically, I wanted to look at it from the point of the way we fund public education here in the state of Massachusetts. Um, and there's a lot of discussion about this among, I was a teacher for 40 years, I've heard this discussion for many years, but a, a lot of talk about being able to make changes in the way we fund our education system, our public education system, could make changes in the equity of public education across all demographics. So if um, each of you would comment on the state funding of public education and how that works. Do you want to go first? Oh, sure. So um, 
something <laughs> throughout the COVID years and when we did the FOIA request, as I was talking about with you earlier, um, we came to find that there is a ton of bargaining that goes on behind closed doors. They bargain with the unions. It's private. You can't get information about it. You can't. It's executive session, so there is no FOIA request. They block you right out of it. Um, and come, you know, by the time they have that public forum, they've already did, they've already bargained with the unions. Um, same thing with the Nurses Association for the school nurses. Um, same concepts. They bargain behind closed doors, and you don't have any idea what's going on. Um, I think that we need to open that process up. I think that's absolutely unacceptable because that right there is some of the salary issues for teachers that you're talking about on both sides of the issue. You know, you got people that want to spend less money, you got the people that want to spend more. Well, both of them, you can't argue something that you don't know what you're arguing. Open up the process. Let people see what's going on. The budget, the breakdown of the budget, as I had said before, it's minimal. It's yeah, minimal. Um, I, not to interrupt, but I wanted to keep it. I absolutely would love to talk about teacher salaries, having been a teacher. But yeah. I'm asking more about the way state the state funds it. And so do you feel that the way it's funded now leads to inequities? And what would you change in the way we're funding public education? Absolutely. So I think that they need to, because of that open that, oh, that open right. process. I think that there needs to be, you know, protections in place. When we give that funding, when the state gives that funding, they should say, okay, how is this decided? How, you know, how is the, how did you go about this decision? There should be guidelines in place for that. If they're not, if the process isn't open, why, why, we don't know what's going on. Um, the taxpayers don't know what's going on. That's a problem. So you open that up on the state, the state, can pass laws and open that process up a lot more. I also, I've got to say, the Department of Education, they also bargain behind closed doors. It's hard to get in, a lot of times, information into these meetings. They've closed them down. Um, and so I think that transparency thing really plays a role in, when it comes to this issue. Great, thank you. Yep. Did we wanna? I'd, I'd take a short-term and a long-term approach to answering okay. that question. So short-term, the easiest answer, absolutely, this November, if you want to increase funding for schools, vote for the fair share amendment. It means the one percenters will provide added cash, and it's millions of dollars that get funneled directly in it. And it, because of the way the bill's structured, Part of it goes to education and part of it goes to transportation and, and it can't be used for anything else, which goes to your earlier question. So for the short term answer, already in November we have an answer with how to improve funding. I think we go back to taxation in terms of the other problems where historically there are red lined neighborhoods. Those neighborhoods also have poorly funded schools because our schools are funded based on the neighborhood taxes and if your property values are low, your taxes are going to be lower and the school funding is going to be lower. So I think if we're looking for a longer term solution, we need to look at countries like Finland. Finland 10 years ago was one of the worst programs for education in the European Union. 10 years later, they are now not only number one in Europe, they are number one in the world and one of the ways that they did this is by having federally funded schools. So every school got the funding they needed. If there's a small community school and a very highly special needs child in there, that one child can bankrupt a very small school with a very small tax base. But if we want good schools which give everybody, no matter what their ability, to have equal educational opportunities, we have to have state-funded schools which will then provide the schools not based on taxation but based on need. Thank you. Uh, are there any follow-up comments or questions on that? Well, education is also a, a big nugget. And as part of education, I did want to ask a little bit about um, my first concern was the way we fund education and how do we think that affects our communities and should we look at changes. But I'm also looking at education. Um, our country years ago decided that 
grades 1 through 12 would be publicly funded. And there's been a lot of talk in recent years about expanding that um, to go down to preschool and up through uh, two years of community college. So I just wanted to get your views on expanding the government's role in education. Um, I think I am abs so I am absolutely for the preschool idea. My kids actually went to Rockport Preschool, um, so and then they went up to kindergarten initially, and then we moved to Gloucester, and we've been here since. Um, so I think that the preschools are great because they start to develop and form the relationships with the kids at the school and you know at an earlier age. I think it's a really, really good thing. As far as the college, I would rather focus on vocational options, funding vocational options before we start looking at funding colleges. Um, the college situation right now is not the best. Um, everything is very, you know, you've got a lot of kids that have gone and gotten degrees and they can't find work for those degrees. You've got kids that have been taken advantage of by their interest rates with their student loans. You've got, you know, the talk of forgiving or not forgiving. Um, everything is very up in the air with college and education right now in that regard. But we do know that there is a, going to be a serious shortage um, in the trades, labor shortage in the trades coming up. And we have also seen schools like Essex Aggie and their, you know, everybody, their wait lists because everybody wants to go there because the programs are so awesome. I think the state needs to expand vocational schooling um, and look at programs like Essex Aggie as kind of a uh, example of what they could be going forward. Um, and you know, try and apply that um, and provide funding for that. I have no problem with providing additional funding for the schools if it's actually needed. But as of right now, we can't get a, a, an idea of the budget, you know, a good enough idea of the budget to give that additional funding. So it's a vicious loop there. Um, but I think that I, I, I think I'm all for preschool. I'd like to expand vocational schooling options in the high school. But as far as college, that is a very personal one-on-one -on -one thing. And with things changing, with online education, with, you know, it's just I don't feel that that's something that at this time we should be investing in. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Nathaniel? I fully support Ashley's statement in terms of investing more into vocational schools. Nobody needs to have to have a college degree. There is honor in being a cabinet worker. There is honor in being a plumber. And I think those are great things to support. Electricians, great. But I disagree with Ashley on the fact that we need to be a more competitive country. We have to think globally. When I was a child in Massachusetts, the number one industry in Massachusetts was education. Does anybody know what the number one is, industry in Massachusetts is now? Health insurance providers. I need to go back to a time where education is our main driver. That's when our economies really boomed. And we are competing on a global scale. It is now a global economy. And we are competing against countries where college education is free. I would be in favor of not only expanding the K through 12 to K through 16, including college that way, but pre-K and child care before pre-K because there are too many single parents who are not able to join the workforce because their choice is, especially since we're not raising the minimum wage, how are you going to be able to go to work if your child care costs more than you're being paid? So we have to make free child care so the working single parents, especially women, can then enter the workforce. We need to make preschool through college free so that we can compete on a global basis because the single greatest investment you can do for any economy is invest in education. Great. Do we have any comments, anyone online or in the audience? Yes. Um, regarding the equity uh, question and, and the funding. I was just wondering what you guys thought about possibly um, changing to uh, an education voucher where each student, kindergarten uh, through uh, 12th grade, would, you know, gets X amount of dollars. And if you happen to live in one of those communities where, um, you know, the tax base is low, 
you take those dollars and you go spend them. You know, go, uh, go into another community, go to a Montserrat school, something like that. We shouldn't, you know, make these kids stay in that situation. It's our tax money. They should be able to spend it, uh, you know, and I trust the parent. You know, spend it uh, in the way that's best for your child, where you think your child's going to get the best buck. Um, and so, Nathaniel. Yeah, just very briefly, because we so do very want briefly, to move. We I only have, have 15 more minutes. So I, I have two five-year-olds. If the best school in the world were two hours away, I would not take them there. So I don't approve of the voucher system. I would rather have every school in every community be the best for those communities. That's why a state-funded education system is the way to address the inequities that are inherent within the system. Um, for me, I believe in school choice. I believe in the voucher system. Um, I believe that what happens when it's not the best school and it's not ran the, the best, those kids are then stuck in that situation. They should be able to go elsewhere. Um, I also believe that that would also stimulate um, competition and growth, and it would keep these schools, you know, on the up and up because they're competing against other schools. Um, and personally, that's my opinion on it. Um, so we're, we disagree okay. on this one. We disagree. <laughs> that's okay. I know I'm okay with that too. It's so hard being the moderator. <laughs> because after 40 years of teaching, I have so much I want to say about education, and I'm not. Um, actually, I had two more topics I wanted to try and get to tonight. I'm not sure we're going to have time for them. One was our health care system, which kind of came up in the last one, and the other is um, the uh, climate initiatives that we have here in the state. And um, if it's okay with folks, I could move on to the climate and hopefully we'll have time to come back to the health care because we are seeing in our little community a lot of changes in in the climate and we all know that climate is a very different thing than weather we've always had heat waves we've always had cold snaps but Gloucester is especially at risk especially its lower lying areas for things like climate change so um, I kind of wanted to ha hear from both of you on what you would envision the state's role being in mitigating some of the uh, climate things that are going to be happening. Okay, so um, I obviously, climate change, the climate's been changing f for millions of years. Um, some people disagree on what's causing it. I am not an expert, so I'm not going to sit here and pretend to be one. Um, but I am going to tell you that I, I've seen changes since moving here myself. I spend a lot of time out on the water. Now, they have put up, um, for example, on the side of the paint factory, they did this big graph with, you know, what the sea level could do. Well, I looked at the numbers on the, gov you know, a, a government, straight from the government, um, and the sea has only risen one inch in 100 years. We have oftentimes have 13 foot tide changes. We have massive storm surges. We have a lot bigger problems than that. So what I think that we should instead be focusing our time and energy on instead of, um, you know, all of this man-made climate change and fighting that out and the back and forth and the politically driven drivel, we need to be focusing on keeping our water clean, our air breathable, we all agree on that. We also need to plan, try and the best we can, we know those like the low-lying areas, plan and predict for problem areas. Come up with a, a game plan. The state should fund that solution. The state needs to provide the funding needed for the town, water, you know, towns and cities on the water to be able to build the infrastructure up so that we're not going to have problems when these storms come through or we have a crazy tide and a full moon at the same time or whatever. So I think that that's really where we should be focusing our time and energy because that's something we can control and change. Thank you very much. Nathaniel? Actually, I'm afraid I disagree on this one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> which, is, which is okay. It is. But, but the reality, as a scientist, I have to say the science is solid. It is not political drivel. It is not something that's made up. 
the science has been irrefutable for 110 years. There was an article that was published 110 years ago that said burning too much charcoal is going to put too much CO2 in the air and that's going to raise the global temperatures. The science is there. We've known it. No need to argue it any further. The problem is we need to address the problem. Right now, even if we were to stop every single form of fossil fuel use today, global temperatures would continue to rise for 100 to 1,000 years. So what we're needing to do right now to deal with the climate crisis is not just stop increasing global emissions, but we have to start bringing down. We need carbon capture. We need to take down the CO2 levels that are in the atmosphere. We said we'd have to be at 350 parts per million for us to stay at a safe temperature. We have blown by that figure by a large margin, and it is time for us to take responsibility. Yes, China is polluting more now, but globally and cumulatively, the United States of America has been the single greatest contributor to man-made climate change, and it is our moral responsibility to address it. If we want to bring it back to immigration, the huge number of immigrations that are going to be a result of the consequences of climate change cannot be ignored. This is an issue that we have to deal with. So it's not only a health issue, it's not only an economic issue, it is an immigration issue. Every single issue that we are dealing with today deals with climate. How do we address it? We need a lot more public transportation. We need to have greener communities. Planting trees isn't going to be enough. We have a lot to do and it is possible. We need to do it now. We have seven years to deal with the hard work. I don't see it's impossible. We have a moral obligation to do with it. Okay. Thank you. Any comments, questions from the audience or the Zoom land folks? Yeah, Bill, I have to yes, absolutely. <laughs> you, you're stressing that you want to have more public transportation, but that you want to turn around and give unlegal or uh, undocumented um, immigrants um, licenses so they can get in their own vehicle and drive. Uh, which way do you lean? Do you lean? Is that directed to oh, Mr. Mulcahy? You know okay. yeah. I'm happy to answer that. So, um, it, China had no high-speed uh, rail 10 years ago. They now have more high-speed rail than the entire world combined. So these large-scale projects are possible within a short time frame. However, 10 years is not next week. And I would rather that the people that are driving tomorrow on our roads are insured and licensed. So I think it's a dual solution. One does not negate the other. We need the short-term solution, which is get everybody a license and insurance now, while investing in the infrastructure that creates millions of jobs to get more public transportation available for everybody now. Thank you. I have a question for Mr. Mulcahy. Certainly. Thank you, everyone, for using the microphone. We want folks at home to be able to hear us as well. We know through the historical record that a thousand years ago, the Vikings were farming and raising livestock on Greenland. Mm -hmm. That's correct, isn't it? That is now true. Now it's too cold to, to do farming and raise livestock on Greenland. Um, how does the science explain that? The science doesn't explain it because you can't pick a single location as the temperature. You have to look at the global temperatures. So we can go through scientific records. There's a wonderful way to measure these things by looking at CO2 levels that are in the atmosphere. You can calculate by the atmospheric CO2 what the global temperatures will be. That's just physics. There's nothing fancy about it. And the way we can do that is by going to places like Iceland and Greenland and doing ice cores. You go deep down into glaciers, you pull them out, and you can go back tens of thousands of years, not just a thousand, but tens of thousands of years, and see what global temperatures were like. There were times where the Sahara was a, a, an ocean. I've been to the top of mountains in Mexico and found fossils of sea life. So yes, things do change, but there is no way we can deny that the huge spike in atmospheric CO2 is directly linked to man-made processes. Um, we only have about five more minutes, and I want to give each candidate two minutes maybe to wrap up. But if anyone has something else around environment, then OK? Anyone? OK. <laughs> um, so. 
um, Ashley, do you mind starting? And we'll just take two minutes each, and that'll bring us right to 8 o'clock. Um, I really don't have a ton to say. I think that this was, I'm really, like, pleased with how this went and how this turned out. Um, I'm getting to know Nathaniel even has been wonderful. I think yeah. that we're, we actually agree on a lot more than, I do. you know, we thought we did. So I think that's great. Um, and it's, it kind of bridges that gap that I was talking about in the beginning. And I think that's important. Um, but I do think that the taxpayers of Massachusetts are really hurting right now and they need to be our focus and the center of our attention. And once we get ourselves better, we can better help others. Um, but right now we're barely staying afloat guys. We've got a lot of people that are not doing very well. Um, you got a lot of people on fixed incomes that aren't doing very well. And so I um, am worried about them. I'm worried about the rule of law and respecting the rule of law. I'm a constitutional conservative, so I'm very into the Constitution. Um, and, you know, abiding by those constitutional values. And um, that's just, you know, who I am. But I, I'm a lover, and I love everyone. I'm one of the nicest people you'll ever meet. So for me, like I said, this was really a good thing for me, and I'm walking away feeling good. And I thank you guys for thank having you. me and for you guys for taking the time to attend. And you guys, too, back there filming, thank you. And uh, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Ashley, I'm 100% agreement. This has been a wonderful evening. I wish Representative Ferrante a speedy recovery. Thank you, everybody, for hosting this, filming this, and reporting on this. Um, just personally, a second, because I know that my children will finally watch this recording. Pina, <laughs> hi. Fede, hi. Jessica. <laughs> so they're five. They're asleep now, hopefully. Um, but I, I have to say hi to them so they won't be disappointed. Um, I'm running for your representative. I'm running to be your next representative. It is an open primary in Massachusetts, so you have until August 27th to change to unaffiliated or any party you wish, so you could vote for either of us. You could vote for Representative Ferrante, Ashley, or myself. And, and you have until the 27th to give yourself the total freedom that an open primary gives you. At its core, representative means represent. And I think it's time that Cape Ann, meaning Manchester by the Sea, Essex, Rockport, and Gloucester have somebody who represents them. That means that they vote like them. For example, minimum wage, Representative Ferrante opposed it. 78% of Cape Ann voters said they want it. The fair share amendment, Representative Ferrante opposed it. Year after year, legislative session after session, 72% of Cape Ann voters say they want the fair share amendment. Ed Markey, who is our state uh, senator, Cape Ann voters voted for him 68% in favor. And this is not just Democrats, it's Democrats and Republicans. 68% of all Cape Ann voters voted for Senator Markey. Representative Ferrante campaigned against him, wrote hit pieces against him in the Gloucester Times that got published in the Washington Post. That is not representing our community. Debt-free college. 58% of Cape Ann voters are in favor of that. Representative Ferrante is not. And Medicare for All, which we unfortunately did not address as well as I would have liked this evening. For 35 years it's been on the docket. It has been opposed by our state representatives. 54% of Cape Ann voters want it. It is time for us to have a representative that votes the way that their constituents vote because representing means representing, not representing your own interest and not voting. 96.9% of the time, the way the Speaker of the House votes. Thank you. I want to thank you guys for coming out. I want to thank um, both of the candidates for being here. I feel very badly that Representative Ferrante couldn't be there. I, I did in, invite her multiple times. Hopefully, she. it's not that she's feeling so poorly that she couldn't come on. I hope, you know, really wish her well. Um, continue the discussion. Go out and talk with your neighbors. And the state race is an extremely important race for us. It really, what happens, at, what happens on Beacon Hill affects your everyday life. So yep. thank you all for coming. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Zoomers. Thank you.